Thank you. The next item of business is a debate on motion 15016 in the name of Graeme Day on a strategy for our veterans, taking it forward in Scotland. I can invite those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now. And I call on Graeme Day to speak to and move the motion. Minister, please. Uh, thank you. I am pleased to be opening this debate today, which will consider how we support our armed forces and veterans communities in Scotland. Uh, let me at the outset move the motion in my name and advise the Chamber that it's my intention to accept all three amendments. Presiding Officer, just over a month ago, my colleague, the Minister for Mental Health, and I jointly facilitated a debate updating the Chamber of the, on the Government's response to the latest report from the Veterans Commissioner and exploring a number of other veterans' issues. Many members here today took part in that debate, sharing their own connections with the armed forces, personal reflections from constituencies and views on the support available. It was evident that there were, continues to be a widespread commitment from across this chamber to improving support. A number of helpful ideas were aired, and I hope that today's debate will be similarly constructive. Of course, since that debate, we have marked the centenary of the First World War Armistice. I had the honour of representing the Scottish Government at several events, including the opening of the Edinburgh Garden of Remembrance, Glasgow's Service of Remembrance, and also at the Festival of Remembrance in Dundee. It was humbling to see so many people attend the laying of wreaths to pay their respects. The ceremonies will live long in my memory. Colleagues across this chamber will have seen similarly uh, touching events in their own areas. But having had that period of remembrance, we now turn to the future. We should rightly be proud of our long history of support here in Scotland in the face of changing demand and better understanding of the needs of our veterans and their families. But it's time to take stock, consider how we best respond to the changed landscape and then act. I was therefore pleased last month alongside ministers from the UK and Welsh governments and representatives from Northern Ireland to launch the UK-wide strategy for our veterans. The strategy was developed jointly across all four home nations and represents a fully collaborative approach to achieving what is best for our veterans across the whole of the UK. But whilst overarching and in some regards requiring a collaborative working between governments, the scope is there to tailor services to meet specific requirements in each of the nations. It sets out that we expect to see a change in demographics. Over the next 10 years, we're likely to see a generational shift in the veterans community, which will be as relevant in Scotland as elsewhere in the UK. This will change how we need to focus our efforts. And to this end, the planned inclusion of a question on veterans in the 2021 census will be key. Today, nearly half of the veterans in the UK are over 75 years of age. But we also have cohorts of veterans who've served more recently and have different needs and different expectations. The strategy therefore sets out the vision and principles which will focus our support for all veterans over the 10 years to 2028 and beyond. It aims to make sure that, and I quote, those who have service in the UK Armed Forces and their families transition back into civilian life and contribute fully to a society that understands and values what they've done and what they have to offer. Further, it looks to fully recognise veterans as assets to our communities, enabling them to maximise their potential as civilians and making sure the right support is available to meet their needs. It assesses the barriers and the opportunities to providing, for providing support to each veteran, including improved collaboration between organisations and better coordination of services. These are aims and aspirations that I think we can all agree upon. The key thing now is how we take the strategy forward in Scotland. As many of the services accessed by veterans here are devolved, the Scottish Government is running its own consultation on the veterans' strategy. We will consult with key stakeholders and representative groups of veterans across the six themes of the strategy, namely community and relationships, which includes looking at social isolation and loneliness, employment, education and skills, finance and debt, health and well-being, and making a home in civilian society and of course veterans and the law the strategy will run uh, the consultation rather will run until february 2019 alongside the uk government's public consultation which is open to all veterans including those in scotland presiding officer in my relatively short time as veterans minister i've already learned that veterans and those organizations who represent them are not slow to let you know what they think that's extremely valuable i very much welcome it particularly where the feedback is about making improvements. If we are to develop services for veterans, we need to know from those at the sharp end where our policies and processes and those of our partners are not translating into effective support where it is required. 
We are at an advantage in Scotland in that we have our independent veterans commissioner who has already examined some of the themes covered by the strategy in depth, consulting widely and recommending changes on transition, health, housing and employability. This enables us to concentrate on a more focused consultation, to canvas the views of key stakeholders, large and small, across the public, private and third sectors and representative groups of veterans. I have already had the opportunity to meet many organisations that help support our veterans and armed forces community, including Combat Stress, Horseback UK, Scotland's Scottish Veterans Residence, Venture Trust, the Career Transition Partnership and the Lothian's Veterans Centre. All of these visits have given me insights into how we could better shape our work in government, and I hope to expand upon that a little in closing. Presiding officer, amongst other things, these engagements have emphasised to me the vital role that families pay, uh, play in transition and beyond and that we must debunk the myth that the majority of our veterans are damaged. They are not. Most are net contributors and assets to communities and employers. But it's important to recognise that some do need help, and I do not shy away from this. As my colleague, the Minister for Mental Health, set out in our previous debate, veterans' mental health remains a priority. The Daily Record newspaper has rightly featured the tragic cases of veterans who have taken their own lives, and it is vital that we better understand what is behind these tragedies. I will not repeat the Scottish Government's actions that Ms Hoggy explained previously, but I welcome the Ministry of Defence's announcement of a study into the deaths of veterans who have served in Iraq and Afghanistan. It will be important to learn as much as we can from this to help us consider what might be done, and the Scottish Government is committed to assisting in that. It's also important to recognise that problems experienced by veterans are not always triggered directly from operational experience. Issues such as PTSD can stem from non-combat experiences. That's something that's been raised by me while talking with veterans themselves. As part of the consultation, I will be undertaking further engagements across all of the themes of the strategy. For example, I'm visiting HMP Gwynochal tomorrow to meet the Governor, himself a veteran, and a group of veterans. I'm working with veterans' charities, large and small, to hear a wide range of views. And last week, I wrote to all armed forces and veterans' champions in Scotland to encourage them to have their say. This debate is an opportunity to hear the views of MSPs, and I'm grateful to Maurice Corey, and to Mike Rumbles, uh, who I've already met with. But I would also ask all members uh, to encourage groups in their constituencies to feed in through the consultation process. We want to hear these voices. Signing officer, the strategy builds on a significant body of positive work that's already underway across government and more widely to champion our armed forces community, ensure no disadvantage, uh, especially when accessing services and support. But we can do better and I look forward to considering the views generated by the consultation and, of course, those of colleagues today. Presiding officer. Thank you very much. I don't think you moved the motion, Minister. You did at the start. Oh, my goodness, I must get my glasses fixed. Um, I now call on Maurice Corrie to speak to move amendment 15016.2, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I must declare an interest that I am a veteran myself. I welcome this opportunity to speak in this debate with my own past experience in the armed forces, coupled with my role in veterans affairs now, I could not be more supportive of the aim to secure a strong and clear veteran strategy. Um, the Scottish Conservatives today will be supporting the Scottish Government's motion and the Labour and the Liberal Democrat amendments as well as moving my own amendment in my name. Firstly, it is crucial that we have a strong sense of awareness, awareness of the veterans around us in our communities and in our workplaces. Awareness of the valuable skill set that they can bring. Their experience in the armed forces prepares them not just for military life, but molds them into capable, versatile, and highly motivated individuals. We, not just as a parliament, but as a nation, need to recognize that. Adjusting our mindset and attuning to how we can best help veterans, together we will help us get it, this right. The collaborative effort on this veterans strategy turns this awareness into a practical and active long-term plan, one which I believe will harness support and agency for our veterans. That is why it is important to ensure that the armed forces units never lose sight of their veterans and indeed their families too, wherever and whenever possible. Veterans in our country deserve every chance we have in society. Far from being at a disadvantage, I believe it is right to utilize their strength and skill that they can offer. 
The outgoing Veterans Commissioner, Eric Fraser, rightly said it would be far more encouraging for veterans if we, could, if we recognize the important contribution that they can make in their various communities and to Scotland's economy as a whole. We must move on from the perception that veterans upon their return are somewhat and somehow lesser or not as able purely because of their experiences and the impact that may have had upon their lives on service overseas or in operations. It is with great encouragement for me that I'm sure that our armed forces personnel to see the publication of the strategy for our veterans. I commend the efforts made to identify in it an accurate thread of themes and cross-cutting cross factors, which I hope will direct how our governments and three sectors can help our veterans to be active agents in our communities. The charitable sector must uh, be at the heart of the delivery of this strategy in Scotland. These groups are integral in their support of veterans. And as I've highlighted in this chamber before, there are 320 armed forces charities in Scotland, charities in Scotland alone. They come alongside, offer training, counselling, therapy and life skills, amongst so many other levels of support. They can provide rehabilitation and respite services, as well as an advocacy and career support. Lady Haig's Property Factory and the Glasgow Helping Heroes are just a few examples of the help available. And as a nation, Scotland's treatment of its veterans has come a very long way. For the most part, their needs are recognised and respected, but we know that more can always be done, and there are still areas in which further support can and should be provided. For example, the process of finding the right housing can be a challenge for many veterans. They can face a lack of clear information, which can often lead to a sense of understandable and, uh, frustration and fuel a feeling of social isolation. I believe this strategy, once implemented, will give greater clarity on how veterans can secure accommodation. And by working together and liaising with experts and veterans themselves, I hope this problem can be solved. The strategy aims to coordinate efforts of veterans' provisions. I, along with my fellow members, believe that this would help to support services more streamlined and efficient in practice. Surely in the long term, this collaborative approach will be far better for mental health well-being of our veterans. So making this a coordinated effort would be hugely beneficial. We have seen the enormous benefits of what happens when groups collaborate to further progress and provide vital solutions. For example, NHS Lothian, Veterans Scotland and the local armed forces community will work in close partnership with Lothian councils to offer support and advice services for per service personnel in the Lothian regions. This is a great uh, encouragement to me and us all, as I'm sure to others here to, in the chamber today. We have seen this in, take place also in our Garlam Butte and the Murray Council areas. Ensuring a strong and informed delivery of this strategy in Scotland can only be done by working closely with armed forces personnel and their families, and along with the organizations that support them. With the composition and needs of veterans constantly evolving, we need to make sure that the work outworking of these strategies reflects the ongoing shift. By truly listening and finding the gaps in their support system, the Scottish Government can adequately reevaluate what changes can be made, and for veterans, this will make a return to their civilian life easier. The implementation of health and well-being services is of particular importance to me, and I welcome its inclusion in part of the, as part of the strategy and ensuring that these are available uh, to veterans who are in the need and will make their future bright, brighter. It will often open up possibilities for these individuals to contribute their skills and experiences within their local communities. This will help them to target loneliness and isolation, issues that armed forces personnel often have to deal with. And we know that there are already a vast range of organizations that help and exist to help veterans tackle these demons, such as combat stress, Poppy Scotland, Legion Scotland, and the Defence Medical Welfare Service. Signposting these health and specialist services is especially important and can be done more efficiently with more prompt data gathering in the veteran community. Better understanding makes for better solutions and more entrenched support overall. And in January, for example, a seminar for service families and veterans will be held in Glasgow Caledonian University, which demonstrates the role academia and education are providing to veterans and their families. And to conclude, Deputy Presiding Officer, as the UK government and the devolved governments have partnered to form this strategy, it is vital that this collaboration goes a distance. I welcome ongoing consultation to this strategy in place, and with this, progress can truly be made for our veterans and their families. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Mr. Corey. And I call on Mark Griffin to speak to move amendment 15016.3, Mr. Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. On a similar basis to Mr. Corey, declaring interest as an armed forces veteran. And we welcome the debate um, this afternoon. We welcome the, the work undertaken by partners across all four UK nations in developing the veteran strategy and the consultation the Minister has started with MSPs, stakeholders and veterans themselves. And I look forward to feeding into that consultation. At the, the outset, I'd like to say that we'll be supporting all amendments and the government motion. And I hope that the whole parliament will unite as I think we're normally always able to do when it comes to showing our support for both the armed forces and veterans communities in Scotland. And like the, the minister and Mr. Corrie have already said, veterans are an asset to, to both Scotland's workplaces and communities. And so we must ensure that we're harnessing their potential and fully supporting them to, to transition smoothly into to civilian life. And while there has been priority given to the health care of veterans, the recent Scottish Veterans Commissioner report makes clear that we can't become complacent about the quality of those services. Positive progress has been made to address veterans' social and housing needs, but recent figures show that this may be reversing with an increase in homelessness in the, the veteran community. A more ambitious approach to both supporting our veterans and ending homelessness, I think, is, is needed to ensure this doesn't become a trend. North Lanarkshire Council has, for a number of years now, uh, given additional points to um, the housing application of members of the armed forces who are due to leave the service, and that's a, a model I would encourage other councils and housing, housing associations to look at. Mental health is a serious concern across the whole of society, but this shouldn't mean that the needs of veterans um, are overlooked. In particular, the Scottish Veterans Commissioner has noted that funding for specialist mental and physical health services for veterans is disjointed and in some cases ad hoc. And the need for specialist physical and mental health services is clear, given the range of physical injuries and mental health conditions some veterans have, and that's why we've included it for consideration um, in our amendment today, which I move now. now. The most recent report from the Veterans Commissioner looked at whether Scotland was getting it right when it came to the health and well-being of veterans in Scotland. And that report concluded that although there has been impressive energy and ambition in establishing specialist health services for veterans over the past decade, this has waned recently and there was um, perhaps I need to rekindle awareness and concerns for veterans' health care. It stated that the concept of priority treatment for veterans was no longer fit for purpose and the vision should instead be on ensuring principles of excellence, accessibility and sustainable treatment for all veterans. And the report also emphasised the need for specialist services to be available to the small group of veterans who have the most severe and enduring injuries caused or exacerbated by military service. It called for assurances that this group, um, uh, assurances for that group that those services would be protected and that their medical and social care needs would be met now and in the, the longer term. Now we would echo that call and ask the government to ensure that these are sufficiently resourced and protected for current and future generations. And while I think it's right that we spend time discussing the needs of the, the veterans community, I think it's equally, equally important that we talk about the strengths. And I'll finish um, as I started, presiding officer, on, on that point. Veterans learn and develop a range of valuable skills in the armed forces that people in civilian life just don't get the, the opportunity to learn. Now, those skills and experiences are ones which companies are, or they should be, they should be desperate for. And I hope then that the message goes out loud and clear from Parliament, from Government, and as part of the new uh, veteran strategy, that businesses would be lucky to have um, access to those skills and to those um, veterans in their workplaces. And on that note, um, I conclude. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you very much. I can call on Mike Rumbles to speak to move Amendment 15016.1, Mr Rumbles. Presiding officer, I'm very pleased to be speaking in this debate today. 
Um, a great many adults in Scotland have served in our armed forces, and while the great majority of veterans go on to lead normal lives and make extremely productive contributions to civilian life, uh, a number don't. I speak as a veteran myself, having served some 15 years in the Army, with my first tour of duty here in Scotland with the Scottish Infantry Division at Glencourse, a tour of duty in Gibraltar, six years and three tours of duty in Germany with the then British Army of the Rhine, and of course two years service in Northern Ireland. I've taken the opportunity in a number of previous veterans debates to focus on the provision of veterans health and well-being services in my own region of the Northeast, particularly in the Grampian Health Board area. And I want to take a different tack in today's debate because I've been struck by the Minister's willingness to discuss and indeed address the issues I've been raising for some time. And I'm very pleased indeed that the Scottish Government will support my amendment today, which focuses on equitable treatment for our veterans across Scotland. And can I just say that at the outset, the Liberal Democrats will also be supporting the Government's motion and indeed all the amendments in the vote later today. People who have risked their lives for this country and given years of service in the armed forces must be safe in the knowledge that they'll return home to well-resourced health and well-being support services, both mental and physical, and that these services will be available to them regardless of which health board area they happen to live in. I know that the minister is personally committed, and I'm convinced he is, to seeing that the military covenant is more than just words, but is manifestly seen operating throughout our public services. In my experience, identifying veterans who present with mental and or physical problems, for instance, at their GP practice, is a real issue, and we should ensure that we have a system in every health board which is an effective first point of contact services, service, ensuring that every veteran is referred to that point of contact in, uh, by their GP and other health professional. Any type of first point of contact system, and I stress any type of first point contact uh, for ex-service personnel, is immensely helpful to the individual in need. And as I say, my view is formed from my experience of engaging with veterans over the years. In fact, although it was some time ago, in my last two years of army service, I had a resettlement officer role, amongst others, and saw for myself the difficulties faced by ex-service personnel and those about to leave the service, indeed. The minister has a real role here, and I hope he will be able to follow this up and report back to us at a future debate in this chamber that every health board is indeed operating such an effective first point of contact service which gives real meaning to the military covenant. Presiding officer, I know time is short. I do very much welcome the constructive efforts on behalf of veterans that Graham Day, as the responsible minister, is giving to his role, and that these positive efforts will produce positive results for our veterans, whichever part of Scotland they live in. I look forward to debating his success with these issues and with him in the next debate and I move the amendment in my name. Thank you very much. And we now move to the open debate speeches of four minutes. I call Stuart McMillan, followed by Tom Mason. Mr McMillan, please. Thank you very much, President Officer. President Officer, I'm delighted to be speaking in this debate. And um, certainly, as members will know, members of the armed forces and ex-service community account for almost 10% of the population of Scotland. And it's vital that we do, therefore, take the steps to actually address the issues that face this portion of our population. Veterans are an asset, but for far too long they have faced barriers which prevent them from actually making their full contribution to society. Uh, just at the outset, I'd like to just pose a wee question to the Minister and ask him to uh, respond, hopefully, in the, his uh, summing up. Just it's regarding the, the census, and I'm aware that the, there will be a veterans question uh, in the census, and I'd be grateful if the Minister can provide an update uh, later uh, when he does sum up. Uh, officer, I welcome the launch of the, uh, the strategy for our veterans, which is uh, UK-wide, supported by the three governments and also delivered uh, locally, and that the new strategy is guided by the three main principles. Veterans are first and foremost civilians and continue to be a benefit to wider society. Veterans are encouraged and enabled to maximise their potential as civilians, and veterans are able to access support that meets their needs uh, when necessary through public and voluntary sectors. And by 2028, 
we need to ensure that every veteran feels even more valued, supported and also empowered. Uh, the individuals leaving the armed forces are undeniably a crucial asset to Scotland as they bring many transferable skills uh, to civilian employers. And because of this, Scotland should take steps to become the destination of choice for those leaving the armed forces to permanently settle here. As a nation, uh, we must also ensure that no member of the armed forces and veterans community in Scotland faces any disadvantage when trying to access services and also support. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge that uh, this Scottish Government is the first administration under devolution to have a, a veterans minister which has proven to be such an important position. Uh, and also the Scottish Government uh, also made that excellent decision uh, by appointing the first ever Scottish Veterans Commissioner. Uh, the operationally independent nature of the Veterans Commissioner has been successful uh, in making sure that the, the Commissioner can effectively scrutinise policy and service delivery. And also the Commissioner has become a voice for veterans within Scotland. Uh, in addition to the Veterans Minister and also the Scottish Veterans Commissioner, the continued funding uh, for Veterans Scotland is essential in order to develop their capacity and also increase its level of support. And since the creation of the Scottish Veterans Fund in, in 2008, over £1.3 million has been used to support projects across Scotland. And this has been incredibly important for supporting the projects that promote employment uh, and skills development. Now, presenting officer, I'd like to touch upon the uh, Scottish War Blinded and also their excellent work. Now, I chair the Cross Party Group in Visual Impairment and earlier this year I was invited to the opening of uh, the Jenny's Well Care Home in Paisley. It's run by the sister organisation Royal Blind. And during the summer I actually went back for a tour of Jenny's Well and also visited the, the next door uh, location which is the Scottish War Blinded Hawk Head Centre. I was hugely impressed uh, by both facilities and also their desire to help even more people get the assistance that they require. As a result, I contacted Jim Boyland of the local Argyles Association, uh, as we met with uh, Richard Baker and also Rebecca Barr, uh, to see how we could actually get more local armed forces veterans involved. Now, that work is very much underway. So, also, the Scottish War Blinded briefing for today was extremely helpful and also highlighted the wide range of support that they offer now. To have an organisation with their expertise, their understanding, but also the finances to assist is hugely important and I know that uh, they have been of great assistance to many people. And the people I spoke to that day in the summer could not have praised them highly enough. Now, in conclusion, presenting officer, uh, working with others is key to making all of this happen. And I'm convinced that by 2028, the Armed Forces veterans in Scotland will have improved outcomes as compared to the, situ the situation they actually have faced in the past. Thank you very much. Tom Mason, please, followed by Stuart Stevenson. Th thank you, presiding officer. I rise to support the motion today and the amendment tabled by my colleague, Maurice Corrie. We are very fortunate to live in an open and free democracy where we are able to debate the ideas and principles that inform our decision making. And indeed, we have the luxury to agree to disagree on occasions. And to be with little doubt, we are able to do so because our democracy has, democracy has been defended when it, when it has been under threat. Throughout the decade, decades, generations of service personnel have answered the call and served their country with honour and distinction. Many return home with storied tales of their service. Others, sadly, do not. It is with this sacrifice in mind that I pay tribute to all who have served, be that at home, abroad, land, sea or air. They represent the very best in our nation. Therefore, we owe it to them not just as an immeasurable debt of gratitude, we owe them whatever care and support they need upon returning home. On that note, I wholeheartedly welcome the new strategy for our veterans report published last month. I particularly would like to praise the tone and the way in which all parties involved have handled this issue. The strategy itself identifies, identifies as members have noted, six key themes that should be at the forefront of consideration when dealing with veteran issues. Each of these are worthy of our attention. When a lower percentage of veterans are in, in work compared with the rest of the population, we need to, need to talk about employment. When almost a third have only one or no close friends, we need to talk about integration into communities. When 27% admit to having suicidal thoughts, we need to talk about physical and mental health. I do wish to specifically mention one theme I didn't include in that list, ensuring that our veterans have a place to live that suits their needs. This should not, in my mind, be a key theme, but a bare minimum. 
and someone, something on which we can, should be doing much better. I do not seek to suggest it is a seasonal issue, but as we approach the winter period, the problem of homelessness becomes even more acute, and I think it's something on which we should reflect. Importantly, the new strategy identifies new cross-cutting factors we can use to improve outcomes across the metrics. I particularly want to mention the vital steps being taken on improving the collection and analysis of data on the needs of veterans, giving us greater evidence base to inform decision-making. Starting officer, as the report itself notes, the population of the UK do value the service of our veterans. And I believe that the veteran community recognises that this is the case. With a strategy that will see through the next, with a strategy that will see us through the next decade, we must keep working at it in order to make the improvements in service delivery that our veterans so richly deserve. I do believe a combined approach between governments, portfolios, and sectors is the right way to go very ably demonstrated by the cooperative work that went into this, this report. The Armed Forces Covenant and all the work that it, that it commits us to is profound, profoundly a good thing. It should, and I'm sure will, focus our minds on the scale of the task ahead. We do a good job in taking care of our veterans, but we can always do better. So let's work together to do just that. Thank you. Stuart Stevenson, followed by Jackie Bailey. Uh, presiding officer, uh, I was pleased in this session of Parliament for the first time to uh, respond positively to an invitation to become a member of the Highland Reserve Forces and Cadets Association. Uh, so I have that uh, limited connection with many uh, former uh, servicemen. Now, of course, for uh, servicemen, they transition to civilian life from active duty largely will go without event. My best man served for several decades in the army. In 1991, I happened to be on a flight from Sydney to Auckland and found myself sitting beside Les Monroe, who was one of the dam buster pilots. He clearly prospered uh, in civilian life. Uh, hopefully my great-great-grandfather, Andrew Barlow, who served with the Royal Corps of Drivers between 1813 and 1818. He doesn't appear to have been at Waterloo, however. He seems to have come out of it okay. And my great-great-great-grandfather, David Berry, who was in the Navy from 1780 to 1782, uh, similarly seems to have prospered. They presumably, like many of our servicemen today, uh, found wonderful welcoming groups of families and communities whom they would draw on uh, for support as they returned to civilian life. But not all are so fortunate. Indeed, uh, even in the walk, uh, from Waverley Station to Parliament, which I do uh, six times a week, um, I know that I pass uh, some less fortunate ex-servicemen. There's one in particular I regularly have a chat with. Um, he's doing well, but he is sitting on the pavement with a little bowl in front of him, and when I have change, he gets my change. It's little enough, uh, but it is something uh, that I would wish to do. He has been failed with the system from the conversations I've had with him, and I'm uncertain uh, what would uh, help him. But he is perhaps the exception. He's not, as far as I'm aware, of someone suffering from PTSD. That's at least an identifiable condition uh, that we can give uh, support uh, to enable, because people with that kind of condition often experience frustration, aggression, uh, and are subject to bouts of violence. And of course, that leads to difficulties in employment relationships and so on. So mental health support is often one of the most important things that uh, that minority of ex-service personnel who have that kind of issue require. Uh, the support they get across Scotland is variable. I think uh, that's a fair comment. So uh, Mike Rumble's reference uh, to the need to make sure that there's access to the right kind of services in his amendment to the motion, I think is a, a proper and timely one. We have a lot going on to be proud of in Scotland. We have something like 50 plus veterans organizations. I think last time uh, we debated the subject, there was a little debate about the numbers and I think Maurice Corrie suggests it was uh, rather higher than that and I'm sure he will be uh, correct. Uh, we all know about uh, Poppy Scotland. That's one that we've just been wearing uh, on our lapels. Uh, and it's, uh, it's a great tribute uh, to Poppy Scotland that 100 years after the uh, 
uh, origin of the poppy as a symbol of remembrance, uh, we continue uh, to use it to this day. Everywhere we go, there are memorials to those who lost their lives, uh, be it the Scots uh, who lost their lives in the American Civil War, where the memorial is in the old Colton Cemetery, the Boer War Memorial on North Bridge, and in every town, village, and hamlet, memorials to those who fell in the two great wars of the 20th century. And in West Lothian, I'm aware of a memorial to the Korean War, but now we owe our duty to those who live on, who need our continuing support. I'm sure we will all wish to give it. Presiding officer. Jackie Bailey, followed by Maureen Wood. Presiding officer, as the deputy convener of the Cross Party Group on the Armed Forces and Veterans, I'm delighted we have the opportunity today to have a debate, albeit a short one, on the strategy for our veterans. A strategy endorsed, as we know, by the UK, Scottish and Welsh governments just last month and a strategy that has at its heart the recognition that service personnel and their families should not be disadvantaged by the very fact of their service. And where needed, that special provision is made to help those who have sacrificed the most, including those who unfortunately have been injured or indeed bereaved. So I look forward to the Scottish Government working with key partners and, and most importantly, veterans themselves, because I think it's important we learn from lived experience as they take forward the consultation about the implementation of the strategy in Scotland. And of course, as we've already heard, the strategy touches on a host of devolved areas, including housing, health, education, skills and employability, to name but a few. I'm very pleased that this is going to build on the valuable work of the first Veterans Commissioner, Eric Fraser, and his successor, Charlie Wallace. They have already brought forward a number of reports about the experience of veterans in Scotland and a series of recommendations that I would commend to the Minister and I hope he will look at them with a view to implementing them. In the short time available, Presiding Officer, I want to focus on Labour's amendment, which talks about specialist physical and mental health services. The Veterans Commissioner rightly noted that whilst priority had been given to healthcare for veterans, he is clear that we mustn't be complacent about the quality of those services and the need for them to be kept under constant review. I know that there is a bit of a postcode lottery between health boards that politicians like to talk about. I have to say there are inconsistencies within health boards and we can and should do much better than that. It is right, and I think everybody would agree with this, that those who have sacrificed the most for their country do actually deserve the best services and care possible. Now, there are challenges with our mental health services. Long waiting times, pressure on staffing, a lack of sustainability, they affect everyone as well as veterans. There is undoubtedly, though, a requirement for specialist services for those, as you know, my colleagues have said, who have severe and enduring problems due to their military service. These services need to be developed, they need to be sustained, and they need to occur not just in health, but in social care too. So I very much welcome the government's mental health action plan. It mentions veterans. I know that veterans experience challenging mental health problems as a result of their service. Some in my constituency have suffered and continue to suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder. And more I know can be done locally to support them. The Veterans Commissioner though asked for a specific plan to tackle mental health amongst veterans. And I would ask the minister to look at this, and in particular, to look at how we remove the barriers to accessing mental health services for veterans, how we deal with that persistent problem of a postcode lottery in services, and how we in particular protect specialist PTSD services. Now, I think we'd all acknowledge the funding for specialist mental health services. It's patchy, it's short term, it's insecure. And I hope the minister, has managed a conversation with the Cabinet Secretary for Finance and will address this in the budget next week. Finally, Presiding Officer, members are right to recognise that veterans are an asset to their workplaces and their communities. I know from the veterans in Dumbarton, the Vale of Leven and Helensborough just what a fantastic contribution they make to our area. I thank them and all the veterans for their service to our country, but it is incumbent on us to repay that by ensuring their transition to civilian life is smooth and seamless.
Maureen Watt, followed by Jamie Halcro Johnson. Thank you very much, presiding officer, and I'm pleased to have the opportunity to speak in this debate, not least to welcome the work undertaken by partners across all four, four nations to develop a veteran strategy. I hope it's ambitious, all-encompassing, and does not uh, end up agreeing the lowest common deno denominator, as our veterans deserve the best. Clearly, the MOD has a pivotal role in this as the employer, but while most personnel, service personnel leave the armed forces to go on to lead fulfilling healthy lives in civilian society, some from day one do not. And for some, later on, aspects of their service will come back to affect them, either physically, mentally, or both. I commend all the businesses and organizations who have ex-personnel as one of their main sources of recruitment. Certainly in the Northeast, the oil and gas sector has employed a great many and to good effect. And I thank BT for their briefing in the work they do with veterans. Presiding officer, there exist among ex-service personnel because of the nature of their work and living situation, a camaraderie that doesn't exist among other cohorts of workers. And that is why organizations like the British Legion are so important. But ex-service personnel and their families must know that there's a wide variety of services available to them. And that's what I'd like to focus on this afternoon. Firstly, veterans are of course able to access all the services that are available to other members of our communities. But many of our veteran services recognize the specialist requirements of our veterans and their families. We're fortunate in Aberdeen, and indeed in my constituency, to have the Gordon Highlanders Museum, where recently they hosted the first section, session by Action for Hearing Loss to facilitate veterans to have their hearing and their hearing aids checked to hear that they're getting the best possible use of these devices. It was a really successful session and quite emotional for those of us who were there as two veterans in their late 80s met for the first time since they left school in Turriff many decades previously. And similarly, I'd like to thank Richard Baker for his briefing on behalf of the Scottish War Blinded for the work they do across Scotland and which was highlighted by Stuart McMillan in his speech. And although I'd heard of veterans' breakfasts in other parts of Scotland, I was pleased on Saturday the 17th of November to attend the first veterans' breakfast at the British Legion in Stonehaven. And I'd la like to thank Brenda Cow and her team for organising this for the veterans who live in and around, actually they came for quite a wide area, to Stonehaven. And what struck me in conversation with the veterans and their families was the the fact that they weren't av uh, aware of the services that are already uh, available for them. And that's why I was delighted to meet up recently with Robert Reed of Defence Medical Welfare Services. Service. This is an organisation celebrating this year its 75th anniversary and works closely in Scotland with the health boards in Grampian, Fife and Lanarkshire. And members will have more of a chance to learn of their work next Wednesday here in Parliament. And I do hope that members will come along, especially those in the health board areas that I've mentioned. I commend the work that the P&J has undertaken recently to highlight the range of organizations available to veterans in the Northeast. And if it's, I have, if it's one plea that I have, Minister, it is that there's one place where veterans and their families know that they can go to to learn where they can access the services that are available to them. Thank you very much. Jamie Halker Johnson, followed by Richard Lyle. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Today's debate is a welcome opportunity to discuss some of the positive work that's been going on uh, across the United Kingdom in support of expanding opportunities for veterans. There have been uh, a number of positive contributions already from around the chamber, and I join with other members um, who have emphasized the importance of the new strategy. We owe our veterans a responsibility to ensure that the duties they have undertaken as part of their service are not ignored. Policy on veterans has had a straightforward principle consistently at its heart, to ensure that our service personnel are not put at a disadvantage by having served. 
We're not advocating for favor or for uh, preferential treatment, but simply overcoming those barriers that we understand veterans can face in re-entering uh, re civilian life. Since the Armed Forces Covenant was enshrined in law in 2011, there's been a notable increase in the focus on those efforts across the country. I emphasize that because a great deal of, I emphasize uh, this uh, because a great deal of, work, of this work is undertaken locally in partnership with local authorities, the third sector and community organizations. The UK strategy, for example, recognizes that a number of the charities that support veterans are more innovative. There is a good reason that they exist within this sphere and smaller dynamic organizations have the ability to be more responsive to, pop, uh, to particular needs. We should also recognize the long experience and efforts of Poppy Scotland, the Royal British Legion and others. A number of members have centered their remarks on particular areas and one I would like to mention is uh, briefly is employment. Only this Saturday during a street surgery in Murray, I met a relatively young veteran who has a disability. He spoke of a problem that faced many people with disabilities looking to enter the work uh, workplace. He wanted to, uh, people to see his abilities, the experience, the drive, the commitment to work that he has demonstrated through his service. Instead, he said too often, potential employers couldn't see beyond the stick he now uses. And of course, many younger veterans leave the armed forces uh, still relatively early on in their career development. They move on from service with a range of valuable transferable skills, but can sometimes have trouble adjusting to civilian employment. There are well-documented hurdles that many have faced, even in first finding a job and in bringing out and acknowledging the skills that they have already built. Employment, education and skills is one of the six focus areas of the strategy, building on some of the work that has taken place before. In 2016's Renewing Our Commitments paper, the Scottish Government indicated a number of schemes in the employability area that were targeted at service leavers. The work with Community Jobs Scotland, access to employability fund and the employment re employer recruitment incentive. And it'd be useful if the Minister could find some time to update us on, uh, on how successful these programmes have been and their uptake amongst uh, veterans. Employment and skills are at the centre of supporting ex-service fa uh, families to find stability and to thrive. But one area that I feel has been given insufficient attention is the impact in particular on, servicemen, uh, on the servicemen and women's family members. Many spouses of service personnel have had breaks in their careers or had their employment options narrowed by the support they give to their loved ones. There are a number of small schemes that operate. They have received little strategic attention from government. There have, been equal, there have equally been a number of small positives over recent years. I was pleased that Skills Development Scotland has created a dedicated online presence as part of my world of work for veterans, serving personnel and families earlier this year. And as my colleague Maurice Curry mentioned, SDS and the MOD's Careers Transition Partnership are undertaking a pilot in parts of my region, Murray and the Highland, uh, to, make, uh, to make early career advice available for the, to those transitioning from the armed forces. Presiding officer, the strategy gives us a basis to drive forward real change in the next 10 years. A solid first step towards that goal will be recognizing success and making sure the response is available to upscale when projects and initiatives work well. These are, our I, these are ideals that unite the political parties and the governments of the UK. And the collaboration that we have seen up to this point will continue to be invaluable in the future. Veterans, veterans have an incredible amount to offer our society. And through harnessing that potential, we not only maintain our covenant with the armed forces, but continue to benefit from their knowledge and their experience as they enter civilian life. And the last of the open debate contributions is from Richard Lyle. Thank you, President Officer. Can I begin by stating it's an extreme honour and privilege to speak in this debate? Veterans are true her heroes that often receive less support and care than they deserve. Colleagues, I know that we all understand the importance of veterans to our society, but it can't be overstated. Perhaps no other choice is more difficult and noble than to give up the comfort of home, leave loved ones and family behind, and put one's own life at risk for one's country. We owe an unpayable debt to all veterans. This year marked the centennial end of World War I, and with it, its persistent reminder that without the sacrifice of so many of Scotland and the UK's people, the world we live in today could look scarily different. We all have connections to veterans. My grandfather was in the Highland Regiment who fought in the Great War. Even now I can remember as a child hearing the stories he told me from the war. He passed on to me 12 volumes from the Illustrated Press on World War I, which I still treasure always. Additionally, my father was an engineer artificer for the RAF in World War II, and he would always talk to me about the various planes he worked on. 
Colleagues, my point is not to state that my family was affected by war, but to say that every family has been affected by war. Every family can trace a member or a relative who joined the Army, the Air Force or the Navy or any other service position. We all know the effects the sacrifice of leaving a family behind has on so many veterans, but perhaps we never imagined the sacrifice continued when they returned home. We have repaid the commendable act of fighting for one's country with a cold welcome home that emphasises a host of difficulties that re revolve around inaccessible housing, limited employment options and sometimes subpar health and social care. Veterans are still an underappreciated under group within our society who are often in need of a serious social, mental and physical help. Sometimes our services are not robust enough and the veterans can fall through the cracks. This to me is simply inexcusable. When I was a councillor, I encouraged my council to take note of the time that service personnel were in the armed forces. This time would count as time served on the council housing waiting list. Therefore, a service personnel would automatically be rehoused if previously lived in a local authority. As already has been stated, this now has been replaced by a point system, and I hope this point system works as it previously did for years. I encourage all councils to introduce this policy. If people go and fight for the country, we should at least make sure that they have a place to live when they could return, and that a house that they live in is suitable for their need. The strategy for our veterans gives us a chance to provide care within the UK that has become world-renowned. Our goals are lofty, but they are reachable. Of course, the progress of this will be monitored to make sure we make good our promises. If we can successfully reach each objective, veterans' lives will be significantly improved, and we as a nation can, in some small way, express our gratitude to those who have done more for us than we have ever done for them. I pay tribute to the projects that are in Scotland are undertaken, and I would suggest that the Scottish Government look at ways to support many charities who are able and who will reach out and assist veterans. Thank you, President Officer. Now move to the closing speeches, and I call Mike Rumbles for four minutes, please. I don't want to take up too much time, Deputy Presiding Officer, but I am actually taken back, um, very much impressed by the contributions from across the chamber. Everybody who has spoken today has spoken with a feeling that everything is not quite right with the way that we treat our veterans at the moment and we can do better. I think um, Graham Day, as the minister, and I'm looking forward to his summing up, has a task ahead of him because not everything in the garden is rosy. Everyone here is well-intentioned and everybody wants to see the best results for our veterans in the future. So I would just like to, to put a little bit of a little bit of pressure on the Minister. Um, I would love him to be able to come back at our next veterans debate and address the points that everybody has raised and to see how we're going to progress those. Uh, and um, I think what I want to say is from the Liberal Democrats' point of view, I think it's a really positive debate that we've had today. Uh, the best veterans debate that I've been involved with so far because, in fact, everybody is really focused on the right outcome. Thank you. Well, that, that was quick, caught me unexpected there, so I shall move on to Alex Rowley, and uh, I could allow you a little extra time if you wish, Mr Rowley. Thank you, President Officer. In closing for Labour, I would like to again offer support for the debate today, and I welcome the backing shown across this chamber that is there for our veterans in Scotland. With regard to the veteran strategy, I am pleased, as Mark Griffin said, to see collaborative working across the United Kingdom to develop and endorse what I think is a much needed and vital strategy. Whilst at the same time, as Graham Day outlined, there is scope to tailor services across the nations, and it's right, therefore, that this Parliament looks at what those services should be. When we last discussed the veterans, uh, issues in this chamber, I highlight this, that whilst welcoming the ongoing progress being made to support former armed forces personnel, there were still gaps in support, particularly for veterans involved in recent conflicts in Afghanistan and Iraq. Jackie Bailey has outlined some of those gaps 
when it comes to mental health and, and welfare support. And I would like to reiterate those points. And I hope that uh, today we are able to take into consideration uh, what the key issues around welfare and mental health are as the government takes forward the consultation on how to take the veteran strategy forward in Scotland. I have heard what Graham Day had to say about the majority of veterans uh, having a very positive contribution to make to society, a point also made by, by Maurice Corey and Jackie Bailey. Uh, and that is right, but the tragic truth is that referrals for post-traumatic stress disorder and other mental health conditions from former armed forces personnel has gone up by 143% over the past 10 years. One of the key aims in the veteran strategy is for enhanced collection, use and analysis of data across the public, private and charitable sectors to build an evidence base to effectively identify and address the needs of veterans. I wrote to the Veterans Minister regarding this issue uh, and the issue of veteran suicide at the time when we were able to, to highlight that, that the numbers of veterans committing suicide was increasing, but that a lot of that data was not being collected. And it's important, therefore, that there is a commitment to ensure that we're able to collect that data. I believe this is needed to allow for better understanding of what is going on, as well as providing a vital resource to prevent further tragedies. So I would urge today that any decisions being made on taking the veteran strategy forward in Scotland takes into consideration the very real problem of the mental welfare and support offered to our veterans. In implementing a strategy, it should be obvious that veterans and their families be given the support that is required as and when it is needed. As Mark McMillan said, we all have a duty to those who have served in our armed forces. I would add to that and say particularly to those who have served in recent conflicts and now need our support. I hope that members across this chamber agree with this. It cannot be overstated the importance of the specialist physical and mental health services to veterans with enduring injuries and conditions. And that is why we need to protect and resource these services for current and future generations. Richard Lell and others also highlighted services and in particular focused on housing services. Again, we should be ensuring that veterans who have served their country are able to get a roof over their head for them and their families. Without properly funded services, warm words and strategies are meaningless. And when it comes to something as important as the welfare of our veterans at the time of their need, I hope we can all agree that this needs real commitment in the form of properly funded services. Thank you. Edward Mountain, I can allow you up to seven minutes, Mr Mountain. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I, too, would like to declare an interest like Mark Griffin, Maurice Curry and Mike Rumbles that I was a soldier and served the country for 12 years. I was a veteran of a regiment that my son now serves in, so I perhaps have a vested interest in that he has served overseas uh, in um, Afghanistan. I think there's a lot that we can all agree on across this chamber to recommend the strategy that has been laid out for our veterans. The vision in the strategy, I believe, uh, that has been set out by the Scottish Government and all three devolved governments uh, means... Um, that we are getting the best by working together and the best for all our veterans. I particularly welcome the commitment from the UK government to consider strengthening the pastoral and legal support available to veterans affected by legacy investigations. I don't propose to dwell on this too much, but it is a matter that is close to my heart and one which I bring to the chamber every time I talk to this. I believe that it's in a small step in the right direction, but I don't think it goes far enough. And I'd like to take this opportunity to ask the Scottish Government to consider doing more when it comes to legacy investigations. I know that technically 
it is not a responsibility of a devolved administration which rests really on health and housing. But the Scottish Government is often prepared to speak out on matters which it considers important. And I believe that it, when it comes to protecting our veterans from legacy investigations relating to op banators, specifically that is Northern Ireland, that this Government could do more by saying more and encouraging the UK Government to protect those veterans in the same way that previous government have protected those that were involved in the actions that they undertook in, the in some other cause. Veterans, those are the veterans, uh, uh, those are the veterans th that I believe have had to make split session decisions based on whether they remove a potential threat or but by not doing so, perhaps sacrifice their and their colleagues' lives. And I don't believe that those are the veterans that we want to see hounded. I believe they must be protected from one-sided prosecutions once and for all. And I would urge the government to consider raising this matter with the UK government. I will take an intervention. Mike Rumbles. Yeah, the member is not pleading for special treatment here. It's, it's basically what you're saying is that we should be treating everybody on both sides of that conflict in the same way, that um, these areas are passed and perhaps we should all move on. Edward Mountain. I, I'm indeed saying that, and, and the example I've used before is that a colleague in my regiment is, is now being persecuted for something that happened in 1970s, yet I know that the person who was involved in the bombing of my regiment in 1982 has been given a clear bill and is allowed to travel across this country without, without fear of prosecution. So perhaps I'll just leave that there, and can I pick up on some of the points that I think have been particularly uh, important. First of all, Minister, I'd like to, to say that I'm delighted that this is going to be a census question as to whether you are a veteran. And I'm glad to hear your view that you view veterans as assets, assets to Scotland, assets to the communities they live in, and assets to everyone they know. And the other thing that I think that we often underestimate is the importance of families. So it was, I was pleased to hear, and, and, and without putting words into your mouth, Minister, I think you, you referred to the families that hold the fort. They are the families that hold the fort. It is a true definition um, of the families that have to stay at home when their family members are serving overseas, probably in difficult positions, to give that family, or that soldier or serviceman, the confidence that they are going to return home to a static position which hasn't changed, which will give them some stability after the difficult times they've faced. I think that Maurice Corey actually stressed the importance of the valuable skills that veterans bring. It's not just about the skills that they've learned, whether it be driving a lorry, it's the leadership skills, it's the response under pressure. They, he went on to say they make a valuable contribution. And I think that one thing that he made which we should never underestimate is the importance of the charitable sector. Now, I know that many regiments have their own charitable organisations who have the ability to be fleet of foot and respond to situations. They are not restricted by government guidelines and they are not restricted necessarily to helping the servicemen. They can help the servicemen's children. Certainly, my old regimental association has helped soldiers' families and specifically soldiers' children, get through university and education. We should encourage those people to continue doing that. I liked Mark Griffin's comments about uh, uh, re supporting veterans by harnessing their skills. And, and Mike Rumbles was very clear when he says that uh, it's up to the, everyone to rise to the call for help when it's required that soldiers have given to us during the time of their service. Um, I, Stuart McMillan made the comment about removing bar barriers from veterans, and I think that's very important as well. And I also agree that we should try and encourage soldiers to come and live here and service personnel to live here when they step down. Tom Mason spoke eloquently uh, about our answers to defending servicemen who've answered the call to defend their country, and they have every right to expect their country to answer their call for help when they ask for it. Stuart Stevenson, uh, it, it made a very uh, uh, important point about sweeping individuals up and helping them personally. And small acts of kindness by people on the street actually gives a serviceman the feeling that they're wanted and cared for. 
Jackie Bailey spoke, spoke very eloquently, as she always does, about service issues and stressed that families are so vital to, to the support of servicemen and, and servicewomen, and that is entirely true. And the need to prevent inconsistencies across health boards, I think that is also true. Maureen Watt spoke about the importance of helping service personnel, as did J Jamie Halcrow Johnson, and about the importance of small organisations. Richard Lyle, and I don't always agree with everything that Richard Lyle uh, says, but he spoke very eloquently this afternoon about the fact that all families know somebody who has served their country at some stage, and therefore it's a debt that we owe everyone. Presiding officer, I would like to reiterate my plea to the Scottish Government and the Veterans Commissioner to explore what actions can be taken to support veterans who are affected by legacy uh, investigations. I am, however, delighted at the consensus across this chamber to help and respect veterans who have done just that for us when they serve. Thank you. I now, now invite Graham Day to wind up in this debate. Um, around nine minutes, please, Minister. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I warmly uh, thank colleagues from across the Chamber for their contributions. This, albeit relatively brief debate, has very much re-emphasised the cross-party nature of this Parliament's commitment to do the best by its veterans and the wider armed forces community. Now, let me pick up on aspects of some of the contributions we've heard this afternoon, now, starting with that of Mike Rumbles, but with a, a nod perhaps to Jackie Bailey also in there. Uh, during the debate in September, the Minister for Mental Health and I, and I made it clear that the Scottish Government is committed to ensuring that all armed forces personnel serving and veterans living in Scotland are able to access, access the best possible care and support, including safe, effective uh, health care that meets their needs. I, I reiterate that again today. Veterans already have a first point of contact. Uh, in the form of veterans champions who are already in place in every health board. But we're working on uh, strengthening the network of champions and better utilising it going forward. We've also shared information with health boards to ensure that all NHS staff are aware of veterans' health rights and continue to work with health boards, champions and stakeholders to raise awareness and address any barriers. But I would say to Mike Rumbles and other members, if you have specific evidence or examples anywhere, not just in NHS Grampian, of veterans encountering difficulty accessing support services, then let us know. Delivery responsibility may lie with individual boards or health and social care partnerships, but we expect, as we set out in renewing our commitments to the document published in 2016, that there should be no disadvantages when it comes to accessing services. With regard to contributions from other members. Uh, Maurice Corey rightly noted the role of the charitable sector in delivering on the aims of the strategy and I also agree with him on the need for effective coordination and collaboration around delivery of services. Uh, can I offer Mark Griffin a couple of assurances uh, around the asks that he had on housing and homelessness. My colleague Kevin Stewart uh, who has oversight of these matters is very much aware of the veterans element uh, to them. On an access to health services and the Commissioner's rep report that he re referred to, I can advise them that the Cabinet Secretary for Health, uh, as recently as this morning, um, sent me uh, an update on our response to that report, uh, on the progress that's being made. And that reflects, of course, the fact that the Scottish Government accepted all of its recommendations. And I'm happy to write to Mark Griffin further on that. Uh, Stuart McMillan asked for information on the census question. The final decision on the inclusion of a census question will lie with Parliament, of course, but the intention of the government is to weigh a draft order in late 2019. And I think, judging by the tone and nature of this debate, I don't think we'll struggle for support around that when that happens. Um, a number of members, including Jackie Bailey and Alex Rowley, raised the issue of mental health. Can I, can I say to the Chamber that mental health is an absolute priority? Record funding has been put in place with the veterans uh, to be captured by this and the implementation of mental health and suicide prevention strategies. But beyond that, we've listened to the Scottish Veterans Commissioners ask about a, a veterans health network and the production of a, a mental health stra uh, action plan from that. Um, uh, so, so this is very much on our agenda. Um, briefly on Edward Mountain's um, central point, I, I very much recognise the passion he has for the subject, and I understand the background 
to that. It is, of course, a reserved matter. He, he knows that. But I'm, I'm happy to pass on to UK government colleagues his views and the views, I think, that were echoed by Mike Rumbles on that uh, issue. Presiding officer, these past five months have been a steep learning curve for myself as the new Veterans Minister. Uh, in October, I set out our achievements to date and priorities for the year ahead. Um, but I've been engaging with organisations and groups of veterans, and I've been listening intently whilst doing that. So I want to offer some observations on areas that I feel where there is clear room for improvement and where we have the opportunity as part of the strategy to look both across governments and with my ministerial colleagues within the Scottish Government to consider further. Firstly, around transition. And I focus on this not to have a dig at the MOD in any way. Indeed, I, I noted that Tobias Elwood, the Minister for Defence, People and Veterans, in the recent Commons debate on the strategy, himself acknowledged more could be done in this area. I, I come to it because it's a recurring theme amongst many uh, transitioning uh, service personnel that I've spoken to. Done well, the transition process really can prepare people who've served for civilian life. Presiding officer, I've had very mixed feedback, however, about the transition process. And I think that it's right that we prior prioritise doing what we can in Scotland to make this work as effectively as possible. So I'm committed to working with the Ministry of Defence to take this forward. And I commend the work that's already been taking place, for example, through the Veterans Employability Strategic Group, chaired by Mark Bibby, to make sure that no one falls through the gaps job-wise. I accept, however, that more needs to be done, and I will undertake to write to Jamie Halkrow Johnson on the points that he raised. But of course, transition is about more than simply finding a job. And in that context, let's remember the importance of the wider family in all of this, something that Edward Mountain referred to. It isn't just the serving sailor, soldier, or airman who is facing a massive change in their lives. It's the spouse, the partner, and the children. If nothing else, these past five months have really brought home to me the importance of the family unit. We'll have to work across governments to look at how they are supported. Many former service personnel and families who settled in Scotland were not based here when they left the services. This year, we published Welcome to Scotland to set out the support available to military families moving here. And we're working to ensure that it's filtering down to those who need it, because there is more we can do in that regard. I'm pleased that the Veterans Commissioner is looking across a broader remit to consider the wider armed forces community himself. Access to employment is another of the key issues for spouses and families. I was delighted recently to meet with senior members of the Navy to explore options for supporting the many spouses who will be settling around Faz Lane as the number of personnel grows in the coming years. I also met Women's Enterprise Scotland who ran a successful course located at Glencross Barracks helping spouses set up their own business. And shortly, I'll be visiting Lucas in the spousal employment hub set up there to learn more about the challenges and successes in this area. Wives, spouses, partners, families face their own issues and need a range of different support. That was very much brought home to me when I recently met with the War Widows Association to learn of the issues faced by their members and the very specific issues, presiding officer. We, I think all of us here, have some degree of understanding that although most transition successfully and are an asset to communities, in some cases, adjusting to civilian life can be difficult indeed. Um, Morris Sonia, Corey. Sorry, Deputy Resident Officer. Um, Minister, you and I have discussed a bit about expanding on this business of the science parks that we discussed in four areas in Scotland. Have you made any progress on that? Because this will tie in nicely with the spouses, uh, recruit for spouses, etc., and also veterans coming out of the forces. Uh, well, I think, as Mr Corey might acknowledge, it was only a few days ago that we discussed that, so the answer is no, not yet. Um, <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, the point I was making, President Officer, that th this can be very hard for the families when it comes to weaving the services, <coughs> and that can be doubly so if the sailor, soldier or airman has been left with physical or mental scars from their service. It strikes me that whilst we have services available for physical rehab and to assist individuals suffering from PTSD. I do think we can, might do better in recognising the strain that's placed on and carried by their families. The launch of the strategy uh, for our veterans and the current consultation process gives us a chance to think about these kinds of issues. Um, and, and I want to pick up on Mike Rumble's brief summarisation of the debate because he was right, was right when he noted about the quality and nature of what we've heard today. It was, he was also right to challenge myself. But at the risk of sounding like I'm passing the buck, it isn't just 
about myself as the Veterans Minister. And I want to reassure the Chamber that the challenge that Mike Rumbles and they have set us is being taken up not only by myself, but by ministerial colleagues in areas of health, housing, socialisation, uh, social isolation and employability, amongst others. Um, President Officer, the strategy uh, aims to ensure that by 2028, every veteran feels even more valued, supported and empowered. Directed by our consultation in Scotland and with the continued constructive collaboration that enabled us to achieve joint ownership of the strategy's objectives, I, along with the ministerial colleagues I've referred to, will be doing all that I can to ensure that we achieve these outcomes long before then. Presiding officer. That concludes the debate on a strategy for our veterans taking it forward in Scotland. And it's time to move on to the next item of business. The next item of business is consideration of a legislative consent motion. I would ask Hamza Yousaf to move motion number 15017 on the Counter-Terrorism and Border Security Bill. Move, President Officer. I will now call members to speak in this debate, and I call on Adam Tompkins. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. In October last year, Andrew Parker, Director General of MI5, described the ongoing terrorist threat facing the United Kingdom as multidimensional, evolving rapidly, and operating at a scale and pace we've not seen before. Attacks such as that at London Bridge in June last year, or the Novacek uh, poisoning in Salisbury earlier this year, are just two illustrations of what Mr. Parker was talking about. Against the background of this heightened terrorist threat, the UK government considers it necessary to update and strengthen key aspects of the legal powers and capabilities available to law enforcement and intelligence agencies to disrupt terrorism uh, and to ensure that sentences for terrorism offences properly reflect the seriousness of the crime. And on these benches, we strongly support that judgment and the counter-terrorism and border security bill that arises from it, which is the subject of today's legislative consent motion. Most of that bill concerns matters that are properly reserved to Westminster, but a minority of its provisions touch on devolved matters, in particular road traffic regulations, legal aid for those stopped at the border, and the retention of biometric material. I welcome the fact that the Scottish Government is recommending that our consent be given to these provisions, and I agree with them that, as they say in their legislative consent memorandum, ensuring that our uh, critical terrorism, counter-terrorism counter measures are consistently applied and available across the UK is important. Of course it is. The measures to be taken in this bill, and in particular the measures that attract the request for our consent today, presiding officer, are necessary to safeguard our national security and are proportionate. In particular, on biometric data, it will still be the case after this bill, as it is now, that data will be destroyed unless there is a sound basis for retaining it. But operational experience has shown that the former two-year retention period was too short, which is why the bill extends this to five years. Likewise, on the power to detain and question individuals at the UK border, this is plainly required. The power in the bill is carefully constrained so that it will apply only on grounds of involvement in hostile activity for or on behalf of another state. The decision to stop and question an individual will not be arbitrary. It will be based on informed considerations as to risk, threat, hostility and intelligence. In short, presiding officer, these are necessary and proportionate powers. The government is right to support them and we should all do so. I support the motion. I now call John Finney also for two minutes, please. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. Th this matter was discussed at the Justice Committee on the 13th of November. And, um, yes, of course, it's important to have consistent application of, of legislation, but it's also to be fair and equitable legislation, and it's certainly not to be trial by the Daily, Re uh, Daily Telegraph, as, as some of the inferences um, from the, the powers the UK government seek to put in place. There's three that apply uh, to Scotland. There's traffic regulation orders, there's legal aid, and there's retention of biometric material. With regard to the regulation orders, I think it's good that the local authorities are reimbursed. Legal aid, great, absolutely great that people who are accused are given that um, a non-means tested advice and assistant. Please can we extend that. The issue is around the retention of biometric material. And the legislative consent motion states the bill will strike a better balance. Well, that better balance wasn't evidenced at the Justice Committee by the Cabinet Secretary. We did hear from an official that chief officers um, in England and Wales have come to the Biometrics Commission on a number of occasions to seek further retention periods. I bet they have. 
So the reasons for retention are changing. The legislative consent motion tells us that biometric uh, material is available for general policing purposes. The Cabinet Secretary used the term devolved purposes. These are uh, serious extensions and serious intrusions. The argument for change that we seem to be hearing is that they are administratively more convenient. I'm certainly not persuaded by that, not least because I believe that information will be shared and put on a UK national database. That's a UK national database with errors. Human rights violations, I understand, may relate to photographic evidence, which has not been corrected. Our obligation is to scrutinise and understand the purpose of legislation. Everyone would want to see an end to violence and the use of maximum proportionate means to address such issues. You would underpin that by human rights assessment. My question to the Cabinet Secretary is, has one been compiled? Has it been published? If so, who has consulted it? Either way, the case has not been made. The Scottish Green Party will not be supporting this. Now call the Cabinet Secretary. Hamza Yousaf. Can I thank both Adam Tompkins and John Finney uh, for speaking to the legislative consent motion and thank you, presiding officer, for the opportunity to respond. The Counter-Terrorism and Border Security Bill is just one part of the UK government review following the terrible incidents in both London and Manchester last year. As you would expect, and as has been mentioned, the majority of the bill relates to the reserved area of national security and is rightly being scrutinised by the UK Parliament. However, there are uh, the three areas that have been mentioned by both members that do, of course, um, uh, we have, have, have uh, uh, implications regarding devolved competency. Uh, the committee and, indeed, John Finney today did raise concerns with provisions related specifically to the retention of certain biometric material. I won't speak to the other two points because I think there's a, a broad agreement uh, around those. Just for some clarity, if I may, the type of biometric material uh, which can be subject of a national security determination is that which is defined in the Criminal Procedure Scotland Act 1995, namely that is fingerprints or DNA. It does not include secondary biometrics such as images. Uh, let me be clear also, the Scottish Government does not take lightly its responsibility with regard to ensuring biometric data is only ever retained and held in circumstances when the intrusions on an individual's rights are proportionate and appropriate. That's why we convened the, uh, if he doesn't mind, I'll, I'll, I'll make, a, I'll make a progress only because uh, the member did say to me, regardless of what I say, he'll be voting against it uh, anyway. <laughs> so if I just make some, some, some progress on this, uh, we convened the independent advisory group on the use of biometric data and in response to the recommendations, we will bring forward a bill to enhance oversight of biometric uh, data. That bill will rightly, by, right, rightly be scrutinised by this parliament. However, it's important to acknowledge that today we're considering the impact that the narrow circumstances under which very specific biometric data can be retained has on devolved competence. Uh, the amendments in the bill relate to a change to the existing maximum extension period, as has been mentioned, from two to five years. But it is also uh, important to, to, to mention that there are no proposed changes to the oversight or safeguards in relation to the retention of data. It will still be subject to the review of the Biometrics Commissioner. And in fact, this amendment was recommended by the Biometrics Commissioner in his annual report published in April this year. In relation, and I will uh, wrap up, uh, in relation to John Finney's uh, uh, concern around databases, um, I'll reiterate that the data in question uh, is that defined by the Criminal Procedure. Scotland Act 1995 does not include images. Uh, biometric data subject to national security determination is stored on a number of national databases. None of these databases is the police national database. And I share, of course, Mr Finney's concerns about the issues raised, not least the recent court judgment that was critical of the governance arrangements for images in particular. Uh, yes, I will. Give me... Daniel Johnson. I, I mean, I heard Mr Finney just a few moments ago, uh, I think rightly asking about human rights assessments. And while I think we are minded to support the government in this LCM, I think the point about human rights assessments is important. Can you answer the question whether they've been made? Cabinet Secretary. At that point, I wanted to answer his question, uh, Mr Finney's question on, on, on databases, or at least address that issue on databases, if I may. Uh, and as I say, we take that issue extremely seriously. Uh, and and, and uh, we will continue to, of course, uh, look to see uh, how this bill progresses through the UK Parliament. And of course, it goes without saying almost that SNP MPs, of course, will also be involved in scrutiny of that bill as they have been uh, to, to this point. In terms of the impact assessment of finish on this point, Presiding Officer, I was asked to reflect on the need to undertake an impact assessment on the specific issues for which we are seeking legislative consent. I acknowledge the concerns raised by organisations and indeed individuals 
regarding the bill in its entirety and welcome the scrutiny that the bill rightly uh, faces uh, in the UK Parliament. However, I do not consider it appropriate for the Scottish Government to undertake an impact assessment on a UK Government bill, the majority of which, uh, which is within reserved competence. So I recognise the concerns that the committee and indeed that John Finney has. Uh, I, rec I agree that the bill needs to be properly scrutinised to ensure any impact is necessary and proportionate. But that scrutiny will happen in the UK Parliament where this bill in its entirety is being considered. The provisions under consideration in the legislative consent motion provide consistency to the application of law enforcement in the UK and will ensure that Scotland is not at a disadvantage in tackling the terrorist threats we currently face. Uh, I did write to the committee uh, to answer General Johnson's point. Uh, my officials did speak to uh, a number of human rights uh, organisations. And while they do have concerns around the bill uh, more widely, uh, they don't have concerns around necessarily the narrow uh, issues that we are considering uh, for legislative consent motion, uh, for this legislative consent motion, presiding officer. <coughs> Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. And the question on this issue will be put at decision time. Patrick Harvey, point of order. Thank you, presiding officer. I'd like to raise a, a point of order relating to an exchange during topical questions today, and I raise it under Standing Order Rule 7.3, 7 uh, which states that members shall conduct themselves in a courteous and respectful manner. Topical question number two uh, from Rora Grant was about the action the Scottish Government is taking in response to Cairngorm Mountain Limited entering administration. And my colleague John Finney was uh, called to ask a supplementary. He made some very reasonably worded criticisms of the, the situation and the, the need for due diligence in the use of public funding. And Mr Ewing responded uh, on behalf of the government, rejecting those criticisms uh, rather angrily. All fair enough within the, the realms of, of debate. Uh, it's not unusual and certainly not out of order for the, the Greens to criticise Mr Ewing and for Mr Ewing to reject those criticisms. He's perfectly entitled to do so. But he then went on to say that he would keep what he called the main parties that support us informed of progress. This response and the very clear indication that my colleague John Finney will not receive relevant updates on government actions in this matter flies in the face of the expected relationship between government and parliament. Ministers are accountable to the whole parliament, not only to those who support their policies and actions. Uh, in addition... In addition, to, in addition to showing respect to other members as individuals, I would argue that Rule 7.3 requires that members should respect the relationship of accountability and the equal status of all MSPs. Parliament should not accept the idea that it's ministers' place to decide who they should be accountable to uh, on the basis that they support the government. Uh, both the, the Scottish, Go Scottish Parliament's publications and the ministerial code refer to the key principles of the consultative steering group on the Scottish Parliament. Uh, they set out that power should be shared between the Scottish Government, the Scottish Parliament and the people of Scotland and the Scottish Parliament should hold the government to account. Can I ask you, presiding officer, to ensure that ministers keep the whole Parliament informed on matters such as this and don't feel able to pick and choose who, they account who are they held accountable uh, by and who within this parliament. Thank Mr Harvey for the point of order and for advance notice. Uh, I was in the chair for the exchange. I did notice the remarks. I did perhaps think that the minister was a, a little offhand in his treatment of Mr Finney. However, it was not personally discourteous. It's very much as Mr Harvey recognised part of the robust political exchange that takes place in here. On the substantive point he raises, uh, I think the Minister will have noted his comments. And I assume that the Minister will keep Parliament informed of developments, just as he did today. And it is, of course, up to the member and any other member to ask questions of the government if they wish to hold them to account. So I thank the member for his point of order. We'll move now, if we can, to decision time. And the first question today is that motion 14984, in the name of Joanne Lamont, on the report on petition PE1463, effective thyroid and adrenal testing, diagnosis and treatment be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next question is that amendment 14016.2 in the name of Maurice Curry, which seeks to amend motion 15016 in the name of Graham Day on a strategy for our veterans taking it forward in Scotland be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next question is that Amendment 1450163, sorry, 
15016.3 in the name of Mark Griffin, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Graeme Day be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next question is that amendment 15016.1 in the name of Mike Rumbles, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Graeme Day be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next question is that motion 15016 in the name of Graeme Day, as amended, on a strategy for our veterans, taking it forward in Scotland, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And the final question is that motion 15017 in the name of Hamza Youssef on the Counter-Terrorism and Border Security Bill UK legislation be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed in that. We'll move to a division. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion 15017 in the name of Hamza Youssef is yes 100, no 7. There were no abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed. Thank you very much. That concludes decision time. We're going to move now to members business in the name of Daniel Johnson on a report on autistic children's experiences of school. And we'll just take a few moments for members and the minister and possibly those in the gallery to change seats. A few moments to change seats. <laughs> 